Hey, what up guys, my name is HB and welcome to the absolute last part of my breakdown video series of my track Age of Aquarius. So let's go. Okay, so we finally arrived at the mixing stage now. I want to say that there's not much of a distinction between the mixing stage and the production stage because as you guys saw in previous parts, I'm EQing as I'm making sounds and shaping sounds. So the, the mixing stage is intertwined with the production stage. So they're not different parts where, oh, now I'm producing and now I'm mixing. I'm really doing both as I'm going along. But, but once I have all of the elements in the track, the first thing that I'm doing is bouncing everything into to audio but before i bounce everything into audio i'm making sure that i'm doing two things one is that i'm using oversampling with the different plugins that i'm using now to be honest i don't know everything about oversampling it's kind of a difficult concept to explain but basically what it means that if you have it on it's gonna up the quality of the sound and you're probably asking yourself why do i even have the option to turn it on and off and the reason for that is because if you turn it on then there's a cost for it and the cost is coming in the form of computer performance so it's very heavy on the computer so that's why usually in the production stage you turn it off so you can produce your song and then once you're ready to bounce everything into audio you turn it on and you can find that functionality in almost every plugin so if you go over here into the global setting inside of serum you can see that we have the oversampling over here we have one which is basically off no oversampling and then we have two times and then four times i usually just go with with four times because my computer can handle it but if yours cannot handle it then i think two times is fine so i'm just making sure that oversampling is turned on on every plugin that i'm using so on serum and then if we have post-processing i know within ableton you can enable oversampling over here if you just right click on a bunch of uh, uh, plugins that they have you can see the oversampling over here i usually don't do that with the eq8 i just don't like the way it sounds so i don't think in that case necessarily it gives you a, a better sound if you do that but i'm definitely enabling it within the fab filter plugins you can go down here where it says zero latency but usually i just go with linear phase and then i'm going with high you can go more than that if your computer can handle that but i think high is enough now you're probably asking yourself another question well is it that big of a change between having it on and having it turned off and the answer is yes especially when you hear it on the master you can clearly hear a difference between having oversampling on and off so that's the first thing you want to make sure that you're doing before you're recording everything and bouncing it into audio. And the second thing that you want to make sure that you're doing before you're bouncing everything into audio is making sure that you're recording stuff at at least 48K and 32 bit. Now, those two factors are going to dictate the quality of the recording. So the higher you go, the more resolution you're going to get, the higher quality the sounds are going to sound. So 32 bit is the highest that you can go. I don't think there's a reason to go below 32 bit, like if you want to work at 24 bit. Unless your computer cannot handle it and you don't have enough room for the files, because the higher you go, the bigger the files are going to be. So 48, that's also the lowest bar that you can work in. You can go higher than that if you want, if your computer can handle it. Also, the higher you go, the, the heavier the files are going to be. So keep that in mind when, when you're doing that. But I think that 48 kilohertz and 32 bit is OK. I think that's what you should work in. Now, the way that you're going to actually make sure that you're going to record in 32-bit is by going into the preferences inside of Ableton and you're going to go here to the record, warp and launch tab and then you're going to see bit depth and just select 32. Now, to make sure that you're going to record in 48 kilohertz, you got to go over here into the audio tab and then just choose here 48 and once you made sure that both of those things are enabled, you have oversampling on on all of the plugins that you're using and you're recording at 32 bit and 48 kilohertz, you can start bounce things into audio. That's why you can see I have a lot of audio channels, but I'm also in order to not to lose the original channels, I'm duplicating them and then I'm bouncing one of them into audio. Now, we've talked about it before, why it's so important to bounce stuff into audio. First up, it doesn't take much power out of the computer as much 
much as having a plugin on. So because of that, you get to avoid certain crashes and, and CPU spikes and, and artifacts that are being added to your sound because of the computer that is trying to compute everything in real time. And second, you get to see a visual representation of the sound so you can see if there's any problem with it. Now with certain sounds, I think we talked about it in one of the, the previous parts, there might be some phase issues. If you have sounds with a bunch of voices and a bunch of plugins like choruses and flanges and, and phasers and stuff like that that mess with the phase of the sound and the stereo information that it has. And as you can see right here, this is the lead sound. And you can clearly see that the phase is kind of off with this sound. You can see that it's leaning towards the bottom instead of being equally distributed on both sides. So whenever you see something like that, it means that the sound is not well balanced within the stereo field. So, so it might falsely trigger stuff like compressors and other plugins that we have on the mastering chains. And once you have a lot of channels like this, you can see how this could really be a problem. So in order to fix that, I'm going to be using a plugin from Isotope. I'm going to be using RX10. So I'm just taking channels that have phasing issues. So I just load them into RX. As you can see right here, I have the lead sound. Now there's two approaches to this. You can be either very meticulous and go bit by bit and trying to fix every part of the sound or you can be lazy about it and trying to fix the whole thing at one go and that's the way I did it because I'm super lazy like that so if you scroll down here on the menu on RX you're gonna get here to the phase tool and what you're gonna do is just hit the suggest button and it's going to listen to the entire sound and then suggest what you need to do with it. In this case, as you can see, the overall sound needs to be rotated 46 degrees into one side. So all you got to do after that is just hit the render button so you can close this window now. So as you can see here, it fixed it. And on average, you can see that it's much more centered instead of leaning towards one side how it was before. So fortunately, I had about four channels like this where I had like major phase issues. So I end up exporting them one by one and then dragging them into RX and doing this exact process as I showed you. By the way, once this is done, you can just click here and export the file and then import it into the project instead of the old file. So that's exactly what I did. So this is the old file and this is the new file. You can see this one is way more centered. So once we did all of that and we bounced everything into audio, the last thing that is really left to do is just level everything in terms of volume. So I'm just going to show you here how I'm doing that. And if you remember in the previous part, we talked about how to level the kick using Pro MB. So that's exactly what I'm doing here with the rest of the elements of the track. So if you remember, the kick is the only element within the track that is allowed to trigger the compressor over here. So the rest of the sounds should start from zero. Now, when I say zero, I don't mean zero volume or zero dB. I just mean that they're on the verge of triggering the compressor. So, so if we take this lead, for example, and try to level it. You can see that it barely triggers the compressor. Now the leads are the second most important thing within the track. So that's why I need them to be on the verge of triggering the compressor. Now, when it comes to other elements, stuff that are more in the background or stuff that don't need to be as loud as other elements, such as this clap sound. You can see that it's so far from triggering the compressor and the way I came up with this specific volume that I'm putting it at is by putting it at a volume that is on the verge of triggering the compressor. And then if it's too loud, I'm just lowering the volume on it. So since I know I don't want the sound to be in the forefront, I just dragged it down by 12 dB. So yeah, that's my method to leveling sounds. As you can see, it's very scientific. I'm not guessing. I'm not trying to uh, rely on my ears too much. I'm just going by a system that I built.
Okay, so before we move to the mastering stage, I just want to real quick show you some stuff that I'm doing here. First off, we didn't talk about the reverb that I have in this project. So I just have one return track where the reverb is at, and I'm sending different channels into the, the reverb track. As you can see, I'm using the Valhalla Vintage Verb. The mix is at 100% because I only want the reverb. But really, there's not much going on in terms of shaping the sound. I have an OTT and an EQ8 cutting out all of the high frequencies and the low frequencies. The reason why I'm cutting all of the low frequencies is because I don't want it to interfere with the kick in the bass. That's a mistake that a lot of beginners do. They don't pay attention to the reverb sounds and then they get muddy mixes. And I'm cutting the high frequencies really not because of a mixing decision. It's more of a production de decision. I just personally, I like dark reverbs. I like when the reverb is more in the back and not in the front. So that's why I'm cutting all of the highs on it. And I'm sidechaining the reverb to duck every time that the lead sounds are playing in the drop. But yeah, other than that, I guess I have some automations here. What I'm doing is just turning off the reverb before the drop. So basically what I'm doing, I'm resetting the reverb so we won't get remaining reverb tails from the buildup. So besides that, I also have effects that affect the overall mix. So I have this reverb and I'm automating the mix to come in in certain points of the track just to give it a little bit of more wetness in a lack of a better term. Since this track is already in the theme of water, I thought it was appropriate to have this kind of effect on it. So as you can see right here, here, just in key moments, um, adding a little bit of reverb and then I'm taking it off. It's subtle, but yet it still makes a difference. And then towards the end of the track, I do have this EQ that is just filtering out all of the highs uh, in this section right here. So I'm having this EQ filter the sound with very high resonance, as you can see. It kind of gives it this effect of like the sound is going down the drain. Uh, once again, keeping it with the, uh, the water theme. So I thought it was a cool touch for the end of the track. Okay, so we finally arrived at the mastering stage. Now, the mastering stage is taking place in a total different project as you can see right here you never want to master your track within the project file that you have all of the plugins and all of the channels and the reason for that is because pc performance and all of the different plugins that you have they take a lot of the cpu so that's why you always want to export the overall audio of the mix into a new project so you can work on it there and once again, you want to make sure that you're recording your master at 32 bit and 48 kilohertz. And if you remember earlier that we talked about checking the phase issues, the same goes to the overall master. So, so what I did is bounce the overall mix and put it into RX. And then I did the, the same thing that I showed you earlier. Now you can also notice how working by the method that I showed you in the mixing stage. And when we talked about the kick and bass, you can see how everything is well balanced and there's a clear distinction between the drop and the break and the build up. You can see how everything is going down in volume and then the drop is hitting over here. There's a distinction between the outro and the intro from the break. So if you're working by this method, you should get a similar result to this. Now I've got an older version of this mix and it's a complete completely different mix from this mix right here. So you can see visually how there's not much of a difference between the drop and the buildup and the break. Everything just looks the same in terms of volume. So this is a bad example of how a master's waveform should look like versus this, how it should look like. Okay, if you're curious, I'm going to play this for you. This is the old version of this track, but I'm just warning you, this is extremely bad.
So yeah, you can clearly hear the, the difference between the two versions. In this one, you can barely hear the kick. The kick is not good. Everything is just on top of each other. There's no real balance within all of the elements in the track. And it represents within the waveform, uh, as we showed before. Like, this just looks like a big chunk of audio. Instead of this, that looks way more dynamic and vibrant. But okay, let's not waste any time. I'm lowering this by 4 dB. The reason I'm doing that is because this is an old track and for some reason I had an instance of utility over here that was at minus 4 dB. So all I did was just delete this utility and then go over here and drop it by 4 dB. So it's leveled well with Pro MB over here. You, you don't need to do that. It's just something that, that I had on the previous project. So that's something that I did for for my end. So really don't 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 sweat about it. But speaking of Pro MB, this is the most important plugging on this mastering chain because it does most of the heavy lifting. And as you can see, this is a tweaked version of the settings that we had in the previous part where I showed you how I make the kick and bass. For instance, you can see that I'm putting it at 200%, which means that the compressor is going to compress even more. So it's going to lower it by more dB. And even though it might sound extreme, I think that it's necessary in order to get the loudest master. Since everybody today is looking to have a louder master, I think it's absolutely necessary that you compress the hell out of your, your, your master. It's going to make things way easier once we get to the limiting stage. So this is with and without. So you can hear how it makes everything sound more tighter, but also what it's doing, we didn't talk about this before, but I'm also using this as an EQ. Each band has its own volume setting, so I'm lowering the lower band by 2 dB and I'm lowering the mid lows by 5 dB. I'm not touching the rest of them, but you can see how it shapes the sound. So I'm taking a lot of the lows and I'm leaving the highs as they are. So essentially what I'm doing, I'm just boosting the highs. So you can think about it as an EQ as well. And if you put it at 200%, it's going to exaggerate it. So really, I'm not lowering this by 2 dB. I'm lowering it by 4 dB and I'm lowering this by 10 dB. And this might change from track to track, by the way. It depends on which genre you're making and which elements you have within the track so you, you feel free to experiment and either boost or lower the, the 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 different bands to get a different result but for this project i felt like this curve right here was the best one last thing that i'm doing is i'm enabling oversampling i'm using the 4x and i'm using the dynamic phase feature you can read about it more over here and you can see what the difference is between all of the phase modes I really encourage you to look more into oversampling and each plugin's version of oversampling so you can get the best result out of all of them. But if I turn it off, this is how it sounds. So I don't know if you noticed, but the highs are way more clear when you have the oversampling on. So overall, we're just getting the better quality. But yeah, moving on, we have the Ozone Imager. Now, really what I'm doing here is boosting the frequency range between 650 and above. And I'm boosting it by 20%, which means it's going to increase the stereo volume in this range of frequencies. And it's going to make things sound more wide, but also since we have a bump in volume in this range of frequencies, it's going to make it sound more bright as well. So think about it also as an EQ. And this is how it sounds. After that, we have the Mag EQ4. I absolutely love this plugin. And all I'm doing is just using this air band to add more high frequencies around the 10K area. I'm boosting it by four, and this is how it sounds.
After that, we have Pro Q3, which is cutting some of the low frequencies that usually tend to build up around this area. So I'm cutting everything below the 23 hertz. And I'm also cutting the high frequencies. So anything above 20K, there's no reason why you would have any information above the 20K since we as humans, we cannot hear above that frequency range. And the way I'm doing it is I have one band of EQ that is cutting it completely. As you can see, I have it on the brick wall settings. And then I have another one, which is set to 24 dB. That's the Q curve of it, the slope of the cut. And the reason why I use that is just to shave a little bit of those high frequencies. If I take it off, you can see that the other one just cuts very abruptly. And I wanted to shave a little bit of that off. So that's why I use this one. And the last thing that I'm doing is I have a high shelf and also a bell EQ that is boosting around this area. So I'm boosting 1 dB around the 4K area and I'm boosting by 2 dB with this high shelf, just boosting all of the highs from 4K and above. And it sounds like this. So you're probably asking yourself, how do you know when to boost and when to cut and how to do all of those stuff with different EQs that you have here? And the answer is just you listen to reference track. So just loading the reference track into your project and see how it compares to the reference track. So if the reference track has more highs then you know, like, oh, I need to boost this range of frequencies to make it sound more like the reference. So that that is really the answer. Just listening to a bunch of reference tracks and try to achieve the same frequency balance that they have, the same sound that they have. Now, next we have this plugin called Soothe 2, and by the name of it, you can already guess what it's doing. So it's soothing the sound that we have. So as you'll see in a second, it will detect where are the problematic areas where there's a bunch of frequencies that are jumping out. And what it will do is just take them down in volume. So it, it will tame them and it will help you achieve a smoother and more balanced sound overall. So as you saw right there, the main thing that it's doing is just taking a lot of those high frequencies around the 10K, 15K, and it's just shaving those off, making everything sound a little bit more balanced and, and more smooth. But really, you should be very subtle with this effect. You don't want it to be too drastic. As you can see, I'm lowering down the mix. I have it on 75%, which means that I'll always have 25% of the dry signal that is going to remain the same. And then on top of it, I have a layer of 75% of what the plugin is doing. And also, as you can see right here, I have this low cut, which means that the plugin is not going to interfere with the frequencies from 200 Hertz and below. So it's going to keep the kick and bass frequencies intact because really the, the kick and bass are perfect and we don't want to interfere with them. I just wanted to tame the frequencies from the 200 Hertz and above, mainly as as you saw right there, the high frequencies in this area. After that, we have this plugin, which I believe it's a free plugin, so I might have a link to it in the description below. But all I'm doing here is just clipping the sound and taking away all of those spikes and transient, as you can see right here. What that will do is going to allow the sound not to falsely trigger the limiter once we get to the to the limiter. So we won't get an exaggerated effect from the limiter and won't limit unnecessarily the, the sound and get all of those nasty distortions that we don't want. So think about it like how you would mow the grass in your backyard and you have all of those blades of grass that are popping out and you're just mowing them down getting an even result. So that's what it's doing, but just a little bit. Once again, you don't want to exaggerate with all of these. 
After that, we have Saturn 2, which is a multiband distortion plugin. And it does the same thing as the Clipper, but it adds more frequencies to the sound and make it sound more rich and full. And as you can see, I have three bands. So in the lows, I have a clean tape with 20%. And then on the mids, I have a warm tube with 20%. And on the highs, I have a subtle tube with 20% as well. Those different saturation modes do make a change in how it sounds. So feel free to experiment with those different ones but yeah mainly i would want to have subtle saturation on the lows and highs because they are the most important frequencies and i don't want to mess with them a whole lot so that's why i have only subtle saturation on them and with the mids i can go with a much heavier saturation to enrich the frequency content but yeah once again you can see i have it on 75 percent so it's a very subtle effect i still have 25 percent of dry signal and I'm using oversampling, high quality, and this is how it sounds. And now we finally arrived at the limiter and I'm using the ozone maximizer. And I like this plugin because it has so much control over the different parameters. So you can really dial in the specific settings that you want and get the desired sound that you want for your track. So starting off with the modes, I'm using the, the latest one that they have and I'm using the modern setting. So what this will dictate is how the limiter is going to go about limiting and it's going to do it in a modern fashion, which means means it's gonna have faster attack and release settings and speaking of attack and release you also have this character slider I always drop it all the way down so we'll get a faster attack and release settings the reason why you want a fast and attack release settings is because you want the limiter to refresh at a higher rate which means that it's going to reset after every itch hit of the kick so we'll get a more accurate limiting and more tight sound overall now I'm adding some soft clipping, just 10%, so I'm clipping the overall sound by a little bit, just so I can squeeze in a little bit more of volume into the limiter, but also beef up the sound by a little bit. And that's pretty much it. Now the only last thing that we have to set is the ceiling, which I'm always setting to minus 0.2 dB. And I'm enabling the true peak limiting, which means that we'll get an even more accurate result because the limiter is going to react in real time to the sound that is being received. And it's going to make sure that we're not going to surpass 0 dB. The last thing that is important to note about the limiter setting is that I have an automation on the threshold. Before the drop, the threshold is set to 11 dB. And once the drop is playing, I'm increasing it to minus 12 dB, which means I'm pushing the volume even more to create a big impact for the drop, to increase the distinction between the break and the drop, and to make the drop hit way harder. And once the drop is done, it goes back to 11 dB. So that's a really cool trick to emphasize the drop even more. And real quick before we go, there's another thing that is happening way before everything else on the mastering channel. We have this EQ that is taking away some of the high frequencies in the buildup as it goes along. And this is how it sounds. So that's another cool trick to emphasize the drop even more is just taking the highs a little bit before the drop hits and then reintroducing them when the drop hits. But yeah, this is it. This is how I master my tracks. As you can see, there's not a lot of crazy stuff going on here. It's very simple and very easy to follow. And this is how it sounds without any of those plugins that we have on the mastering channel. Thank you. 
And that's it. Hopefully this was helpful for you guys. Let me know in the comment section down below. And if there's something that you didn't understand and you have more questions, you can always join my live streams. I stream on Twitch. I stream under the username VHB. That's T-H-E-E -E underscore H-B. I stream every Sunday around 6 p.m. GMT plus two time. So feel free to join. I'm always down to help. And I know that I had a lot of stuff to cover under this breakdown video series. So that's why I'm thinking of doing short form tutorials for these subjects that we covered within this series. So be on the lookout for those. And if you're watching until this point, I appreciate you a lot. So if you want to support and listen to the full track, there's a link in the description down below. And I will see you guys on the next video. Bye.